Later that afternoon, I hike back up the wrong side of the river, where just as I expected, I find Steve and Dave. It's been a slow morning, but Dave is starting to get some action. There are definitely fish on this side of the Ekelok, and for all we know, they have never seen an artificial fly. They're on the bite, man. They're on the bite now. Fish on. Feels like a decent fish, too. Could this be one of those truly trophy-sized char we've been hearing so much about? Hey, it's a nice fish. Look at that thing just taking out line. <laughs> Yippee! Look at that. Ooh, that's a nice fish. I'm gonna have to run after this thing. Holy shit. Oh my god, this is kicking my ass into the backing. And backing and backing and backing and backing. Dave Bishop has been a fishing guide in eastern Canada for nearly 30 years. He's an Atlantic salmon expert, but he's new to Arctic char and he's suddenly finding the experience a bit shocking. While other anglers watch from the traditional right bank, Dave finds himself sprinting downriver. This thing went from being 100 feet away from me to 100 yards in about six seconds. Big, big fish. This is a nice fish. It can't be denied that something has impacted the fishing in the Ekelok this season, at least in comparison to earlier years. But when you finally hook a fish like the one Dave is battling, it's hard to be anything but enthused about this remarkable fishery. No. It's up to Jack and Bill and the Inuits in the fishing camp below to work out a viable shared resource plan that satisfies both their needs in preserving the traditional culture of an indigenous people. I've been reeling for the last 20 seconds and it's all backing while providing superb recreational angling and genuine adventure for others. Down to the running line now. That fish is about 150 feet away from me now. Wow. What a run. What a run. Keep him up out of these boulders so they didn't cut me off. Oh, he's long, long time. Look how big, look at the size of that fish. Oh, oh, oh. oh, baby. He's not done yet either. Oh, look at the tail on that. Oh, oh, oh. All right. Oh, look at that fish. Look at that beautiful fish. Oh, baby. Caught steelhead and salmon, but these things, pound for pound, no comparison. And I hate to say that as a salmon guide, but that's the way it is. All right, you can grab them right there. Hang on, I want to get around that boulder. Look at the size of that thing. Grab them, grab them, grab them. Oh man. Oh man, Woo! yeah baby, yeah baby, got her done. Char of a lifetime, unbelievable. Great, great fight, what a majestic fish. Unfortunately, Dave's big fish couldn't be revived and it would become part of the camp's larder. Wow. Let me get a snapshot of you. Good. Oh, that's an awesome. After spending the rest of the afternoon fishing the top section of the river, Dave made his way down and ran into a strange and beautiful sculpture. How could he know that Steve had built this prayer tower hours earlier to successfully summon the Inuit fish gods? He was even more confused to now find Steve sitting just below his tower in obvious distress. An errant cast had lodged a big weighted fly deep in his hand. Don't know if uh, Mike crimped the barb down. Mike made this. 
most likely he did. He crimps almost all his barbs down. That's what I was hoping he did. It's in the bone, isn't it? It's hitting the bone? Yeah. It's hitting the bone. Right in the knuckle. Right up here. Doesn't have a barb, you're gonna get it out. It's not sliding. Ah. Ay, ay, ay. All right, let's go. Big char in one hand, big char fly in the other. Dave and Steve hike back to the rendezvous point for pickup. That's amazing. <laughs> That's awesome. Steve describes building his prayer tower to Dave, who is duly impressed. No idea when you're running around. Hi, guys. Hello. Hey, hey. Had a good day. Yeah. Yeah, we got a couple. We had to kill the fish because he took it down into the into the gills. He's okay. Okay. Yeah. Look at this, my little fella. As big as you. Yeah. yeah. The German Thomas caught the 38 inch fish. And Steve caught himself. Yeah, Steve oh, got yeah. caught Look himself in the hand. Uh -oh. Uh -oh. Yeah, it's, it's in the knuckle. Okay. We shall operate. And operate we did. Fortunately for Steve, Dr. Al had a full medical kit along, or this might have been a lot more painful. I get that point through there now, and, and we'll try and cut it off. Okay. Doing okay. Still got a little barb on it. There we go. <clears throat> Nobody's eyes got it. Okay, here we go. There we go, good job. A little hemorrhage there. There's no dogs. Put on it. You know, I built that little prayer tower over there, and the next cast caught that big fish. And then I come up, and my last cast was right at the prayer tower. And The gods and give it, and the gods so take it away. They, they keep, they're keeping me humble, yeah. aren't they? Yeah. yeah. You gotta love a fishing camp where you can read past clients' testimonials as cabin graffiti right on the walls. This is just part of the remote Arctic ethos and diverse angling community created by Jack Ellefson, who is the force that keeps the Ecolup camp clicking. Here he describes how it all began. I met Bill in 1984. I was a radio officer expedition leader on the Limblad Explorer cruise ship came through the Northwest Passage. That's how I met Bill. And I was uh, walking up and down the river for days on end and uh, casting and casting. Never caught the fish. Of course, the run wasn't done yet. And one day the whole river exploded and I thought I had uh, gone to heaven instantly. And I said to Bill, this is unique. And uh, Bill took my word. And that was actually the beginning. It's a fantastic place. It's a fantastic place. And uh, I come here to recharge my batteries. But if Jack is the heart of the Ecoluck camp, Bill is the soul. A quiet and spiritual man, he tells me the story of his dying mother's last words of wisdom. She said uh, to us as children, uh, when we were gathered just before she passed on, and she told us that we only know two things that, that really happened to us in life. And she said, we're born for sure, and we're going to leave again. But what's in between those two, you have to make those as good as you can for you and your fellow people around you. Hopefully that I live by that, and the people that I bring here, that come here to share it with us, are, you know, having a good time, and hopefully they bring back good uh, memories and stories back to their family. Bill's wife, Jessie, champions Inuit culture while raising children and grandchildren in a modern world. Here she cooks bannock in their tiny cabin before heading outside to prepare Dave's char into traditional dry fish. That's a big fish. Dry fish has been made by the Inuits for thousands of years and is still a staple food for many folks living this far north in the Arctic. 
It is prepared in an ancient ritual which ensures respect for the fish and future success for the fisher. It's important that we hang the fish with the skin side out first and also that the fish is facing the direction where it was swimming. That's supposed to mean good luck. These fish have been hanging here for a few days, ready to be turned over. There we go. And here are two fish. They are ready to go. Partly dried, fairly elastic. So the way we eat them, we throw them, we put them on the kitchen table like this with a salt shaker and a sharp knife. And everyone takes a bite, cuts off a piece of fish, a little salt on it. And of course, yes, it's good tea to go with it. Jessie's good tea is just one more example of living off the land. Out on the tundra, she collects sweet-smelling heather, which she burns to create smoke to flavor her tea water. The end result is Arctic ambrosia. It's a God's gift to man, a cup of tea like this. Perhaps so. But God's real gift to those who search for wild fish in wild waters are the amazing Arctic char of the Ekla. Didn't have a whole lot of time to fish myself, but got a chance to catch one of these absolutely spectacular sea run Arctic char. Nice, beautiful fish, I'm gonna let him go. 